Hello, Grace Lutheran Church and friends. I'm Dr. Mark Peters, professor of music at Trinity Christian College in Palos Heights, Illinois, and it's my privilege to bring you this cantata preview for the Bach Cantata Vespers on Pentecost Sunday 2021. It's also my, also my privilege to begin with these words, peace be with you. These are the words Jesus speaks to his followers in the gospel reading for today. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Peace be with you. J.S. Bach composed his cantata 34, O Eviges Feuer, O Orsprung der Liebe, for the first day of Pentecost in 1727. He returned to it later and transformed it into a wedding cantata with the help of an unknown poet who skillfully crafted a new wedding text that would fit with Bach's existing music. And he came back to the Pentecost version of the cantata at least once more later in his life, leading a performance of it probably in 1746 or 1747, just a few years before he died. In this brief introduction to Cantata 34, We'll start with a musicological puzzle, because who doesn't like a good musicological puzzle? And then we'll move on to talk about the text and then introduce some aspects of the music that we can listen for in the service. So we begin with a musicological puzzle, and this has to do with the chronology of the cantata. I just indicated a particular chronology for cantata 34, which I'll reiterate here, and that's that it was composed for the first day of Pentecost in 1727. Just a side note here, that Pentecost uh, was one of three major feast days in Box Leipzig, going along with Christmas and Easter. Each of those was celebrated as a three-day festival. So this, uh, Pente as for the first day of Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday, there would have been another cantata on Monday and another on Tuesday for this three-day festival. So composed for the first day of Pentecost, that's Pentecost Sunday in 1727, Bach then revisited it um, sometime after that point, we don't know exactly when, um, and transformed it into a wedding cantata using some of the music from uh, Cantata 34, and as I indicated um, with a poet writing a new text for that, um, for this source, we don't have a lot of source material. We have the full text, but we don't have all the music that Bach wrote for it. And then um, Bach returned to the Pentecost version of Cantata 34, again, later in his life, around 1746 or 1747, and made some adaptations to it for that performance as well. But if you read, for example, Alfred Dürer's monumental volume, The Cantatas of J.S. Bach, or Christoph Wolff's famous biography, Johann Sebastian Bach, The Learned Musician, or any other number, or any number of other sources published before the year 2010, you'll find a different story listed, which is this. Um, that this originated as the wedding cantata, and that the wedding took place in 1726, and that Bach then came back to it later in life in 1746-47 for that, that performance I indicated, so that he took his earlier wedding cantata from 1726, and then he changed it into a cantata for Pente Pentecost in 1746 and 47. But we know now that's not the case, so the question is what changed? So here is the, the chronology as we know it, it now, and what changed is research by uh, Russian musicologist Tatiana Shabalina, um, and she uh, did a lot of research in the early 2000s in the collections of the Russian National Library and combing those collections for sources uh, that related to J.S. Bach and the German Baroque. She discovered a number of items that um, helps to revise a, a, a lot of items of chronology in relation especially to Bach's sacred vocal works. Many of these were text booklets. Uh, these were printed texts of the church of church music that members of the congregation could purchase. Like a, it's like like a bulletin going into church. But aren't you glad that uh, Grace doesn't make us pay for the bulletins? They just give them to us for free. But in Box Leipzig, you could buy uh, these booklets, and it was not the the whole liturgy. It was, uh, but it was the texts of the church cantatas or the passion that was being performed, so that members of the congregation could follow along with the text while listening to the music in the service. 
So discovering these text booklets, as Shabalina did, uh, were important for discoveries about what music Bach performed in uh, Leipzig, whether composed by himself or by others. Uh, but they were also significant because the text booklets uh, were generally dated, so they named uh, a year on them. So we know more of when these compositions were pre performed. One of the text book look booklets that Shabalina unearthed included the text of Cantata 34 for the first day of Pentecost, and it was labeled in 1727. So this is the, um, the words from the title page uh, for that text booklet. So uh, texts for the Leipzig Church Music for uh, the Holy Feast of Pentecost and for the Feast of the Holy Trinity in 1727, Leipzig, and then names the publisher for that. Um, and again, because Pentecost was a three-day festival, this, this booklet includes four cantata texts. So for Pentecost, first, second, and third day of Pentecost, and then for the next Sunday, which is the Feast of the Holy Trinity, Trinity in 1727. So from this, uh, Shabalina discovered that this, this cantata for Pentecost actually originated in 1727. Um, and when she went back then to the source material, she learned um, uh, this uh, revised chronology that this cantata in this version for Pentecost actually comes before the, um, the wedding cantata version of it, not after it. Um, so this is uh, significant for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a cool story about what, <laughs> what musicologists do, so you gotta love that. Uh, but more importantly, it allows for a secure dating of Cantata 34 that places it, its first version early in Bach's time in Leipzig, rather than 20 years later in the final decade of his life. It also reverses the order of the chronology, as I just noted. So it had been thought that the Wedding Cantata BW 334A came first, and that um, the Pentecost Cantata BW 34 was a parody of it, that is a, a, a new revised version based on the earlier music in the Wedding Cantata. But we, now we know that's switched, that the first version was for Pentecost, and then, then it was uh, changed into a Wedding Cantata, but that Bach retained it as a Pentecost Cantata for later in his life as, as well. So we shift now into the second section um, of this introduction to Cantata 34 and think about aspects of text. As with every Bach cantata, the cantata's text explains and comments upon the gospel reading for the day, just as the sermon does. Today's cantata does that in very interesting ways. And a side note, as for most of Bach's cantatas, we don't know who wrote the libretto, but suspect it was a pastor or theologian in Leipzig. So a couple interesting things about this cantata's text. First, the cantata clearly references both the epistle and the gospel for the day, while most of Bach's cantatas reference only the gospel. This makes good sense on the first day of Pentecost, and I imagine many pastors around the world today did the same thing. That's because the actual events of the day of Pentecost, the gathering of the disciples, the rushing wind, the tongues of fire and speaking in other languages that accompanied the filling with the Holy Spirit are recorded in the epistle, Acts 2, verses 1 through 13. The gospel necessarily takes place earlier chronologically, since it is, of course, during Jesus's earthly life. In John 14, 23 to 31, we hear Jesus's promise of the coming of the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom he says, the Father will send in my name after he had gone away. There's a second interesting way that Cantata 34's text engages the scripture readings, and this I'd like to illustrate through a reading of the Cantata's text. So usually here I point out key words, phrases, and theological concepts that are drawn from the gospel, and those things are there in Cantata 34. But even more so today, I hear whole movements in dialogue with particular verses. So I'm going to invite you to listen to the text in this way. So I'm simply going to read the text in dialogue with these particular verses from the the epistle and the gospel for the Feast of Pentecost. 
When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. O fire eternal, O wellspring of love, enkindle our hearts and consecrate them. Let heavenly flames penetrate and flow. We wish, O Most High, to be your temple. Ah, let our souls in faith be pleasing to you. Jesus answered Judas, not Iscariot, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Lord, our hearts hold your word to be the truth. You gladly want to be among people, therefore may my heart be yours. Lord, graciously enter in. Such a chosen sanctuary has itself the greatest glory. Jesus answered Judas, not Iscariot, those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. Happy are you, chosen souls, whom God has destined for his dwelling. Who can choose a greater salvation? Who can count the multitude of blessings? And this has come from God. But the Advocate, the, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. If God chooses the sacred dwellings that he inhabits with salvation, then he must also pour out his blessing on them. Then the seat of his sanctuary is rewarded. The Lord proclaims over his consecrated house the word of his blessing. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. Peace upon Israel. Thank the most miraculous hands. Give thanks that God has thought of you. Yes, his blessing works with power to send peace upon Israel, to send peace upon you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. So the text of Cantata 34 does not directly quote any Bible verses or hymn verses, as, as most of Bach's cantatas do. Uh, it's all newly written poetry, but I think that it's a beautiful reflection of a text that is deeply grounded in the epistle and gospel for the first day of Pentecost. Finally, on the text, I also appreciate the way Martin Petzold summarizes it in his Bach Kommentar. Um, and you can see in this chart a few things. So on the left side, the numbers are the, are the movement numbers. And then to the right, uh, those are the movement types. So whether chorus or recitative or aria. And he's clearly showing here how, how movements one and five are linked both thematically and uh, sharing movement type. Same thing the way that movements two and four are linked and share a movement type. And then we have that central aria in movement three. And that reading now from bottom to top, starting with, with movement one, that the opening chorus tells the people of God that we are eternally chosen, and to be eternally chosen is reflected then in peace that comes upon Israel and upon all of us in the final movement. From movement one, and then moving out from four to five, uh, so movement two names that the people of God are chosen, and that to be chosen is also to be blessed, and that to be chosen and blessed is also to be consecrated, to be set apart, to be holy. Then the, that key central movement, it's also the longest movement um, in the cantata, uh, names the reality of the peace of Jesus Christ, which is salvation and blessing for the hearts of those who are chosen by God. Moving now into the final section, 
um, of this introduction and to think about the music that uh, Bach wrote for this text. I'm leaving uh, this slide here so we can see that structure from Petzold because it also introduces us to the cantata's musical structure as I've named in that mirroring. So the, that mirror image of first and last movement choruses, we have very short uh, recitatives in the second and fourth movement, and that very long aria in, in the middle, which as you um, if you read in the, the bulletin for today, the program notes uh, name that as being called the most beautiful aria Bach ever composed. Now, I can't personally re agree with that um, as long as Mache dich mein Herzerein from the St. Matthew Passion exists, but it's still a, a very beautiful aria. Since the two uh, recitatives are so simple and straightforward, I'm not going to say re really anything more about those, but I'm going to focus on the three framing movements, the two choruses and the central aria. As a backdrop for that, I'll talk briefly about one aspect of how Bach, Bach often structures his vocal music like this, which is a three-part formal structure, uh, what's called a ternary form. You hear the th three-part form in that. So you're, you're used to hearing this in box cantatas, especially in the arias. So we have an opening section that we, we simply use um, letters to, to label this as the first musical section. So we have that first musical section or the A section, and uh, which has the first about half or has the first number of lines of the arias text. Then we move into the B section. Uh, which does two things. One thing is that textually it gives us the rest of the text, so we get the remaining lines of the text, but it also provides musical contrast in a number of ways. Uh, you, there's usually a modulation to a new key, a new key area, um, and um, a, a change in mood in that central section as well. And then we have a return to the A section. So we go back to that first music, which of, or, which of course is a return to the original key and also to the original mood that we have in that first section. This is also known as a da capo form. You may know it as that as well. Um, but the important thing is that it has these three parts with a mirroring of the first two. And just like uh, the entire cantata itself is a, is a mirror form across the five movements, Movements one, three, and five are each in, in a ternary form as well. So in some ways, um, each of these key movements uh, is also structured, structured as a mirror itself uh, because it's engaging ternary form in some way. Um, so a quick overview before I talk about each uh, movement individually, each of these three movements, and then uh, we'll also listen to a small sample of each one in advance of hearing the entire cantata together in, in the Bach Vespers service. So the um, three-part form that we have in cantata 34 is that we have it, uh, Bach does this in three different ways. Um, so one is a strict da capo, and I'll come back and explain each of these. Uh, the second is uh, we can refer to as a written out da capo, or we label as ABA prime, uh, meaning that it returns to the initial music, but there's, it's not an exact repeat. It's uh, changed in some way. And then I coined a term for movement five in pre preparing this, um, and I call this an is it a da capo. Um, and you see the form here. So we have those A and B sections, but Bach's doing something really interesting in this movement, and I'll explain more about that when we get to it. Um, so to start with, uh, movement one sets the mood for this festive Pentecost cantata. It's important to note that, um, again, that Pentecost is one of these three major feast days in, in the church year, and it's expected that on the first day of Pentecost, you're going to have trumpets, you're going to have drums, you're going to have a, a big celebratory cantata on that day, just as you would on the first day of Christmas and on the first day of Easter. Um, so we're going to listen to the cantata's opening now. This is uh, performed by the ne Netherlands Bach Society as part of their All of Bach project. Um, which I highly recommend and is all available free online on their website. Again, uh, the All of Bach project. Uh, the program notes uh, in today's bulletin for Grace point out some key things to listen for. Uh, they point out the uh, stylistic evocation of the flickering flames of Pentecost, Bach's compositional attention to the words Feuer, or Fire, and Entzünde, and Kindle, 
and the long notes in so associated with the word avigus or eternal. So we'll listen now to the, the opening of that first movement. B section, so that the second contrasting section, uh, which sets the final three lines of, of the text, Bach switches to a more fluid style, emphasizing the words, let heavenly flames penetrate and flow. This section is in a, in a minor key with the trumpets and timpani silent, and um, in this strict da capo form, Bach simply indi indicates at the end of this B section, go back to the beginning and repeat the A section. So this is, uh, musicians will be used to as a da capo form, you have a sign of where to go back to, and then once you go back, a sign of, of where you stop the second time through. So that, that's what Bach does in this. Um, and in this way, Bach doesn't have to copy out the rest of the movement. He simply indicates, go, go back and repeat that A section exactly the same way uh, that it was performed the first time through. Uh, so we're back to the major key with trumpets and timpani at the opening, and we hear again those first two lines of the cantata's text. Bach's third movement aria, following just a brief recitative, is in a completely different mood and scoring, and today's bulletin rightly names it as a love song offered to God by the believing soul. The sound of the movement is really distinctive among Bach's arias. It's scored for two flutes uh, with muted strings and continuo. And let's hear the opening of the movement for these ele elements.
Bach once again presents the movement in a, th a three-part form um, as a de capo, but does so differently. Instead of it indicating an exact return to the A section like he does in the first movement, Bach does in this case uh, write out uh, the return to the A section. So it's still a return to the opening music, it's a return to the opening mood and to the opening lines of text, but by writing it out, um, there are kind of two aspects of this. One, as I as I alluded to with the first movement, it's a lot more work for Bach to write this out rather than indicate a return. So obviously he was, was very intentional about this. Um, and Bach actually did this more than his contemporaries. Um, it was much more common to indicate a, a strict da capo, go back and repeat the A section. Bach used this, uh, what we call a written out da capo, um, more, generally more often than most of his contemporaries. Um, and what it does in this case is um, it allows for really fluid transitions between the sections. The way that Bach composes this particular movement, it moves very fluidly into and out of the B section, something that's harder to do with a strict da capo. You kind of have to stop and reset at the beginning of the movement, but as a very uh, clear and smooth transition uh, between the sections in this aria. Uh, Bach also shortens the instrumental introduction um, to the A section when it returns, so allowing us to hear the voice enter uh, more quickly, um, sooner with these um, opening lines of the text, happy are you, you chosen soul, whom God has destined for his dwelling. So moving now to the final movement, here Bach returns to the celebratory mood and scoring of the first movement with trumpet, centimpani, oboes, strings, continuo, and chorus. And this time, uh, we, we are going to listen to the preceding recitative. That's it's really short, uh, because Bach follows the text's indication by writing a really cool transition uh, into the last movement. Uh, really connects the recitative with the final movement chorus. So the recitative ends by stating, "The Lord proclaims over His consecrated house, that is the Christian believer, the word of His blessing." And the recitative's closing punctuation mark is not a period, it's a colon, so there's some something that's coming next, and what is coming next is God's spoken word of blessing to God's people, peace be upon Israel. So we'll listen for um, the recitative and then that transition after that declaration, peace be upon Israel, uh, by the full, full, uh, <laughs> ensemble together, then it moves into kind of the bright celebratory music that we would expect even more for this uh, closing movement. So muss er auch den Segen auf sie schütten, so wird der Sitz des Heiligtums belohnt. Der Herr ruft über sein geweihtes Haus das Wort des Segens aus. So this is the movement that I'm labeling the is it a da capo form, my newly minted term. Um, and the real answer is it doesn't matter <laughs> if we call it a da capo form or not, but Bach is borrowing elements of da capo form, but he's doing something new and interesting with them in this movement. Um, so we're going to kind of think through that. What we just heard um, is the A section. Uh, which we heard first just as instruments, 
And then Bach goes back, this is not uncommon, goes back and repeats that instrument, instrumental section, but adds the voices in layered on top of them. So that could be a, a, a standard typical A section. Um, and uh, But what Bach does next is, is really interesting. Um, so this is followed by the B section with in instruments alone. Um, and one thing that's distinctive about the B section is that it's not actually very contrasting to the A section. We're not going to listen to it here, but you'll notice that when you hear it in the service. Um, uh, Bach keeps the same celebratory mood, and he even stays in the same key of D major. And then things get even more interesting. Rather than hearing the B section with voices, that would be the next thing that we would expect uh, here, but um, Bach instead returns to the instrumental version of the A section. It's as if the Christian church is ecstatically caught up in the peace of God, uh, so much so that it's been rendered speechless in its joy. But once the words do return, they don't stop. Bach concludes the movement and the cantata with the B section, vocal and instrumental, and the A section. So both of these sung all the way through with no break in one of the most joyous expressions in all of Bach's music. So we, as we enter into the, uh, the experience of this cantata and this worship service together, we celebrate the words of Jesus, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid.